Hello everybody, today I'd like to talk to you about Leo Strauss's essay, German Nihilism. Leo Strauss was born 1889, died 1973. He was born in Germany, but spent most of his career in the United States at the University of Chicago. If you know anything about him, you might have heard of his name in association with American neoconservatism as the intellectual godfather of American neoconservatism, or perhaps you don't know anything about him at all. I hope that you'll find today's video to throw some important light on his cast of mind and we help his arguments guide us through a situation that's relevant to us today uh, as well as it was when he wrote it. Also, if you know Carl Schmitt, but you haven't read any Strauss, I'd like to point out to you that Strauss's response to Schmitt's concept of the political is now included in the expanded edition of Schmitt's book, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner where it says, Notes by Leo Strauss. Schmitt said about Strauss's notes on his essay that Strauss saw through me and x-rayed me as nobody else has. In other words, Schmidt held Strauss in the highest regard as a reader of his own work. And for those of you who know Schmidt but don't know Strauss, that should pique your interest in finding out more about what Strauss had to say about politics, about the political, and about um, matters that are of interest to you and to us today. But today I want to talk to you about Strauss's 1941 lecture called German Nihilism. It was published in 1999 by Interpretation, a journal of political philosophy, and it was originally given at the New School in New York. Now, as we walk through this essay together, there are going to be many long quotations on the slides, and I wouldn't normally do that, but this essay is so rich, so interesting, and so important that I wanted to walk through it together with you at times word by word and line by line to try to bring out Strauss's argument and its relevance for us today. So Strauss identifies the key questions of his essay as follows. First, he wants to answer, what is nihilism? Secondly, how far can nihilism be said to be a specifically German phenomenon? Now, his responses in this essay to these two questions will be provisional. He doesn't claim to give a complete and comprehensive analysis of the phenomenon, but even his provisional remarks will prove to be extremely rich and illuminating. Now, German nihilism, the most famous form of German nihilism is Nazism, National Socialism. Strauss called, calls that the lowest, most provincial, most unenlightened, and most dishonorable form of German nihilism. So you're correct to think about Nazism when you think about German nihilism, but only as its lowest form. Well, to call Nazism the most unenlightened, dishonorable, lowest and provincial form of German nihilism is to leave it open, to leave the possibility open that there's a higher, more universal, more enlightened and more honorable form of German nihilism. Now, Strauss writes that Nazism's very vulgarity probably accounts for its great, if appalling, successes. Successes, remember, writing in 1941, that may be followed by failures and ultimately by complete defeat. However, the defeat of National Socialism will not necessarily mean the end of German nihilism. For that nihilism, he writes, has deeper roots than the preachings of Hitler. Deeper roots than Germany's defeat in the First World War and all the rest of it. In other words, if we draw a parallel to the contemporary situation, we may say we have Trumpism today. The rise of Trumpism. 
as a result of the last election. But Trumpism will outlive Trump. It has deeper roots than Trump. Its significance far exceeds Trump himself. So Strauss in 1941 is saying the same thing about German nihilism. It may be related to Nazism. Nazism may be its lowest form. But it has much deeper roots than Hitler and Germany's reaction to World War I. And its significance will live on past the demise of the Nazi regime. Strauss first examines what German nihilism is not. It is not, he says, the will to nothing. The destruction of everything, including oneself. I do not believe, he writes, that such a desire is the ultimate motive of German nihilism. Now, some people may have thought otherwise, that that's precisely what nihilism is. A total no to everything, including oneself. A desire merely to destroy and to include oneself in the act of destruction. No, that is not, according to Strauss's analysis, what nihilism is, what German nihilism is. Even if such a desire were demonstrated to be the ultimate motive, the desire just to destroy, we would be at a loss, Strauss says, to understand why that desire, the desire to destroy, took on the form precisely of militarism in the German case. So he says, why didn't it drive the nihilists to alcoholism, for example? That's another form of self-destruction. That's another form, in a way, of the obliteration of the experience of oneself and of the world. Why did German nihilism take the form of militarism? A proper analysis has to be able to explain. And just to say that the desire was destruction doesn't explain the draw of militarism. To explain German nihilism in terms of mental diseases, you know, some sort of mental aberration, he says, is even less advisable than it is to explain in such terms the desire of a cornered gangster to bump off together with himself a couple of cops and the fellow who double-crossed him. If you can understand it, the rationale behind a cornered gangster bumping off a couple of cops and the fellow who double-crossed him as he goes down himself in that situation, if you can understand the rationale behind that without thinking about it in terms of mental disease. So you have to understand German nihilism without thinking about it in terms of a mental disease. In other words, there may be a rationale. There may be something behind the nihilistic drive that is not just a mental aberration, but that is rationally comprehensible. The fact of the matter, Strauss writes, is that German nihilism is not absolute nihilism, desire for the destruction of everything, including oneself, but a desire for the destruction of something specific, of modern civilization. Nihilism is a desire for the destruction of modern civilization. But, Strauss thought, in the case of this nihilism, the negation of modern civilization, the no said to modern civilization, is not guided or accompanied by any clear positive conception. So it's primarily negation of, of modern civilization without a clearly positive alternative. German nihilism is not against everything modern in the sense of being also against the modern technology, but it primarily objects to the morality of modern civilization. That means to the emphasis on the relief of man's estate, comfortable self-preservation and consumption, safeguarding the rights of man and the greatest possible happiness of the greatest possible number. These principles of the morality of modern civilization are what are the targets of the passionate ire of the German nihilists. The motive of German nihilism is moral protest based on a conviction 
Strauss writes, that internationalism, like no borders, and the open society, these goals of modern civilization, are incompatible with the demands of moral life. German nihilism is based on the conviction that the root of all moral life is essentially and eternally the closed society. The society with borders. So open society, if not immoral, is at least amoral and lacking seriousness. Are you beginning to hear some resonances? with modern-day moral protest against internationalism and open borders in the name of serious morality and closed communities? Let's look at the argument. Moral life is serious life. Morality is a serious affair. It's the rejection of just base pleasure, mere life, frivolity. Seriousness and the ceremonial of seriousness, like flag and the oath to the flag, are the distinctive features of the closed society, according to the argument of the German nihilists. And the closed society is constantly confronted with and basically oriented toward war. Whereas the proponent of internationalism, the open society, the relief of man's estate, comfortable self-preservation, and so on, is not constantly confronted with and basically oriented toward war, toward serious matter of real enemies and the potential for death in combat. Strauss continues his analysis by writing that the societies of the West, which claim to aspire toward the open society, are actually closed societies in a state of disintegration. Closed societies that have lost their way. And what moral value or respectability they still possess depends entirely on their still being closed societies. Lauren Southern, whom some of, you, some of you know is making a documentary now called Borderless, posted today a post on Twitter, a couple of posts on Twitter, that make precisely this point, where she says, liberals who argue in favor of open borders and so on are speaking from such a privileged place where they don't have to worry about the threat of external enemies where they don't have to worry about the age-old real possibility of conflict with an enemy. And that people who call for open borders and who call for an open society are doing so from within societies that are still closed, that still do have borders and still do have people risking their lives to protect them. You see, so this is Strauss's formulation of that problem. Open society is not even possible, he writes in a few very rich passages of this essay, because progress, as the progressives see it, is largely fictitious or merely verbal. Certain facts, certain basic facts of human nature, which have been honestly recognized by earlier generations, who used to call a spade a spade, are at the present time verbally denied, superficially covered over by legal fictions and other fictions. The hypocrisy of the open society, which tricks itself with these fictions and verbal games, makes open society inferior when compared to the honesty of the closed society, which at least calls a spade a spade. The conviction underlying the protest against modern civilization, Strauss writes, has basically nothing to do with love of war or with nationalism, 
because there were closed societies which were not nations. But it does have to do with what is called the sovereign state. Again, think about those people whose primary argument or primary model, argument in favor of or model of the closed society today is the state with its borders, as opposed necessarily to the nation, to the national identity. The state is the best example, Strauss writes, of the closed society in the sense indicated. With the flag, the ceremonials of moral seriousness, the threat of an enemy outside, the threats of criminals inside, and so on. But rather the conviction that lies behind German nihilism, according to Strauss, that he's trying to describe, is not primarily a love of war, but rather primarily a love of morality, a sense of responsibility for endangered morality. The passionate protest against the city of pigs in the name of noble virtue is not itself nihilistic, according to Strauss. Let me repeat that. To want to defend noble virtue against the base pleasures, motives, and desires of the city of pigs or of lackadaisical consumerism is not itself a nihilistic motive because it was shared by Plato and other non-nihilists, for example. Although that passion, in a much more passionate and infinitely less intelligent form than it takes, for example, in Plato, undoubtedly played a role in post-war Germany's hatred towards subhuman cultural Bolshevism. And we ask ourselves to what extent a passionate and less intelligent form plays a role against cultural Bolshevism today. But Strauss's point is that this passionate love of morality and protest against its degradation is not itself nihilistic. So, the love of morality is the root motive of nihilism. It is not necessarily nihilistic, though it can lead to nihilism, and did so in post-World War I Germany. In post-World War I Germany, no one could be satisfied with the state of affairs. In particular, German liberal democracy seemed to many people to be absolutely unable to cope with the difficulties with which Germany was confronted. And that confirmed a strong existing prejudice against liberal democracy. There were two alternatives to liberal democracy that were proposed. Reaction, reactionary thought, which just said, let's roll back the wheel of history to a previous time. And what he calls one of the more interesting alternatives in this situation, the revolutionary response to liberal democracy. And now he's going to describe the revolutionary mindset among leftists and the reaction to that mindset, the reaction to the communist revolutionary ideals by the young nihilists. So he writes, the older ones in our midst still remember the time when certain people asserted that the conflicts inherent in the present situation would necessarily lead to a revolution, accompanying or following another world war, a rising of the proletariat, which would usher in the withering away of the state, the classless society, the abolition of all exploitation and injustice, and the era of final peace. It was this prospect of a communist revolution, at least as much as the desperate present, which led to nihilism. So not only was it the terrible situation in which Germany found itself after the war, it was also the prospect of a classless society and a communist revolution that led to nihilism. Now listen, listen to these passages. The prospect of a pacified planet without rulers and ruled, of a planetary society devoted to production and consumption only, to the production and consumption of spiritual as well as material merchandise, 
was positively horrifying to quite a few very intelligent and very decent, if very young, Germans. Now, I'm about to read you some incredible passages, but I want to emphasize for you. Strauss is acknowledging that the German nihilists were very young, yes, but also very intelligent, and what's more, very decent. He's not immediately saying that to be horrified by a classless human uh, community of pure equality is to be deplorable. No, he's saying that you could have a revulsion towards the communist ideal while nevertheless being very intelligent and very decent. What they hated was the very prospect of a world in which everyone would be happy and satisfied, in which everyone would have his little pleasure by day and his little pleasure by night, a world in which no great heart could beat and no great soul could breathe, a world without real, unmetaphoric sacrifice, a world without blood, sweat, and tears. What to the communists appeared to be the fulfillment of the dream of mankind appeared to those young Germans as the greatest debasement of humanity, as the coming of the end of humanity. They really did not know, and thus they were unable to express in tolerably clear language what they desired to put in the place of the present world and its allegedly necessary future or sequel. The only thing of which they were absolutely certain was that the present world and all the potentialities of the present world as such must be destroyed in order to prevent the otherwise necessary coming of the communist final order. Literally anything, the nothing, the chaos, the jungle, the wild west, Hobbes' state of nature, anything, seemed to them infinitely better than the communist, anarchist, pacifist future. Their yes, their positive program, was inarticulate. They were unable to say more than no. This no proved, however, sufficient as the preface to action, to the action of destruction. What a powerful analysis of the motives of the young German nihilists. But Strauss has a criticism as well. And you please take notice of the way in which Strauss is able at least to state the arguments of the young nihilists, to state their motives, to have a sympathetic account, an understanding account of what drove them. He doesn't launch into criticism by smearing them, and dismissing them, deriding them, and mocking them. He first makes the effort, a truly sympathetic effort, to state what might be driving them before, before he begins to point out what he thinks are some of the weaknesses with their argument. So Strauss says that the young German nihilists took over the communist thesis that the proletarian revolution and proletarian dictatorship is necessary if civilization is not to perish. Only they emphasize this latter part, that if civilization is not to perish. So they said, fine, let it perish. That way we'll avoid the communist revolution. If the only way to keep civilization alive, according to the communists, is for there to be the next stage in this history of, in this dialectical history of human existence so that we overcome private property and the bourgeois order with a proletarian revolution, they say, fine, let civilization perish. If that's what it takes to avoid this nightmare of the communist takeover. Strauss says more about this fallacy or about what he thinks is the mistake in the reasoning of the young nihilists a little bit later on. But now he turns his attention, and what I think is one of the most important passages of this lecture, now he turns his attention to the failings 
of the teachers in a message that is all too relevant to us today as we deal with academic politics that push students who may find themselves in the center with some suspicion toward the leftist takeover of the university and of sectors of society. Professors who push such students further and further to the right through their unsympathetic denouncements. So Strauss warns us against that type of behavior. Unfortunately, so few professors who have read his essay understand his advice and take it to heart. But let's see what he says about that. I am convinced, he writes, that about the most dangerous thing for these young men, just about the most dangerous thing for these young men, was precisely what is called progressive education. They needed rather old-fashioned teachers. Such old-fashioned teachers as of course would be undogmatic enough to understand the aspirations of their pupils. Think about how much that's missing today. Teachers who are undogmatic enough to understand the aspirations of their pupils. Unfortunately, Strauss writes, the belief in old-fashioned teaching declined considerably in post-war Germany. So these students had just about the most dangerous thing that they could have, a progressive education instead of an old-fashioned, undogmatic one. The adolescents I'm speaking of were in need of teachers who could explain to them in articulate language the positive and not merely destructive meaning of their aspirations. They believed to have found such teachers in that group of professors and writers who knowingly or ignorantly paved the way for Hitler. Strauss is referring to here, here to the writers of the conser German conservative revolution. But note, they needed old-fashioned teachers who could explain to them in articulate language the positive meaning of their aspirations. How much is that missing today from our universities? And how much are some of our public intellectuals today filling that void? Of course, they get the backlash of the university in response. Now, opponents of the young nihilists. This is also a very important point. So Strauss has just criticized the teachers of the young nihilists for failing to be undogmatic enough to understand the aspirations of their students. Now he's going to criticize the opponents of the young nihilists. Opponents, their opponents, frequently committed a grave mistake. They believed to have refuted the no, the rejection of modern civilization, by refuting the yes, the positive program, the inconsistent, if not silly, positive assertions of the young men. So for example, let's suppose that today you think ethno-nationalism is, like Steve Bannon said, for losers. And therefore you dismiss the no that those people say to modern civilization. If you think you can dismiss the no or the rejection on the basis of the yes, the positive suggestion, Strauss is saying that's a mistake that opponents make. One cannot refute what one has not thoroughly understood. And many opponents did not even try to understand the ardent passion underlying the negation of the present world and its potentialities. As a consequence, the very refutations confirmed the nihilists in their belief. These passages are so important. The opponents of the young nihilists made so little effort to understand their motivating passion that they confirmed the nihilists in their belief that their opponents don't know what they're talking about, that their elders are unable to lead them through the current situation. If you're a young student who goes to campus today and you despise something about what you think is the leftist takeover of the university and you have professors who have no sympathy for that moral passion that you have against the predominant campus morality, if they have no understanding of it, their lack of understanding will 
fortify your belief that the university has become a place bereft of intellectual manpower. Now, the opponents of the young nihilist, Strauss writes, for them, their belief in the principles of modern civilization had become a prejudice. In other words, it had become something that they no longer are able to defend at its foundations. It had become like an inherited belief for them, the goodness of modern civilization. And therefore, in the encounter with young nihilists, they became apologists for modern civilization. The result is that they had to take the position of reactive, defensive apologists. Whereas it's in their nature, as progressivists, to be aggressively oriented against the, the inherited past, towards the future that's still unfolding. But in this case, they took on a conservative stance, a defensive stand, which looks, Strauss says, like admitting defeat. The adherents of the ideal of progress were in the awkward position that they had to resist in the manner of, cons of conservatives, what in the meantime had been called the wave of the future. So they failed theoretically, they failed strategically, and they failed tactically, the opponents of the young nihilists. They gave the impression of being loaded with the heavy burden of an old and somewhat dusty tradition. Whereas the young nihilists, not hampered by any tradition, had complete freedom of movement. And in the wars of the mind, no less than in real wars, Strauss writes, freedom of action spells victory. Now, Strauss says that the German nihilists, the young German nihilists, could have been impressed. So remember, their teachers failed them. Their opponents failed them. Failed to deal adequately with the challenge posed by the young nihilists. But Strauss argues that the German nihilists could have been impressed by Churchill's 1940 answer to the moral problem of modern civilization, if only they had heard it. So you already see at this point in the essay, Strauss is starting to suggest, which he'll do even more strongly in the conclusion, that somehow Churchill and the British war effort you'll see in more detail something about English, British civilization as such, could give a satisfactory response to the moral passion of the German nihilists. More satisfactory than the progressive teachers could give. More satisfactory than the opponents of nihilism could give. I take it for granted that not everything to which the young nihilists subjected was unobjectionable. In other words, many of the things to which they objected were objectionable. And that not every writer or speaker whom they despised was respectable. Strauss acknowledges. For example, the, our version would be that there are those who are deplorable, who have good grounds on which to object to some of what they see, to despise some of the people they despise. Now, here in his brilliance, in his justice, in his moderation and understanding, Strauss articulates a principle that is timeless and also very timely. Let us beware. Remember, he's saying this in the context of expressing sympathetic understanding to the claims of the young nihilists. Let us beware of a sense of solidarity which is not limited by discretion. And let us not forget that the highest duty of the scholar, truthfulness or justice, acknowledges no limits. In other words, if he was saying, we are defenders of Western civilization, they are opponents of Western civilization, we must therefore stand together in solidarity and pay no mind to the merits of the arguments that are on their side. Well, that would be a sense of solidarity that is not limited by discretion and that doesn't exhibit the highest duty of the scholar. You see, truthfulness or justice, which acknowledges no limits, is, stands above 
above a sense of solidarity that might keep you from truthfulness or justice. So having articulated this principle, Strauss says, let us not then hesitate to look for a moment at nihilism from the point of view of the nihilists themselves. Let's see how they understood themselves. Let's step into their shoes. Let's try to articulate their position as they themselves saw it. This is a way of proceeding that is valuable for us today, whatever phenomenon we're tr trying to understand. So nihilism according to the nihilists. Nihilism, they would say, is a slogan used by those who don't understand the new, but see only the rejection of their cherished ideals, the destruction of their spiritual property. They judge the new by its first words and deeds, which are of necessity a caricature rather than an adequate expression. In other words, they see the flash and the bang, and so they go ahead and they call us nihilists and so on. But what they don't understand, what they don't understand is what we're building toward, what lies behind the flash and the bang. The Nazis, Hitler, the less said about them, the less said about him, the better. He will soon be forgotten. He's just a contemptible tool of history, a midwife who assists at the birth of a new epoch, of a new spirit. And a midwife usually understands nothing of the genius at whose birth she assists. In other words, Hitler, forget about Hitler. He's just a tool ushering in a new era. Don't focus on him. Focus on the new era he's ushering in. A new reality is in the making. It's transforming the whole world. In the meantime, there's nothing but a fertile nothing, a pregnant chaos. The Nazis are as insubstantial, the nihilists say, according to Strauss, as unsubstantial as clouds. The sky is hidden by those clouds, which announce a devastating storm, but at the same time, the long-needed rain, which will bring new life to the dried-up soil. Now, Strauss has a response to this rhetoric, to this siren song, as he calls it. He says the young nihilists expect an answer to the first and last question, in other words, to the most important questions of moral and political life, from history, from history. Remember, they say we're ushering in a new epoch, a new future. History is providing us with this new answer. And they mistake analysis of the present or past or future for philosophy. They believe in progress toward a goal which is itself progressive and therefore undefinable. They are not guided by a known and stable standard, which is known and not merely believed. So Strauss criticizes their positive program for being overly reliant on the idea of history and for lacking a stable, rational standard. The lack of resistance to nihilism among its proponents seems to be ultimately due to the depreciation and contempt of reason, which is one and unchangeable. So, notice, Strauss is now opposing reason, rationality, as one and unchangeable, as a source of standards. He's opposing rationality to its depreciation, which substitutes for reason history. If reason is changeable, he says, it's dependent on those forces which cause its changes. It's a servant or slave of the emotions. And it'll be hard to make it will be hard to make a distinction which is not arbitrary between noble and base emotions. Once one has denied the rulership of reason. Strauss is cautioning. What happens when you reject the rulership of reason? Well, he has a book called Natural Right and History, which traces this progression from classical political rationalism to modern historicism and romanticism. So if you want to learn more about Strauss's view on the relationship between reason and history, You'll have to read those works, but in this essay, we'll get a lot of the argumentation as well. So Strauss now, Strauss now puts on the table 
a more complete definition of nihilism, nevertheless tentative, but let's look at it. It's the rejection of the principles of civilization as such. So, a nihilist is someone who knows the principle of civiliz knows the principles of civilization, at least superficially. And a merely uncivilized man, a savage, is not a nihilist. So nihilism is rejection of the principles of civilization, therefore presupposes some knowledge of the principles of civilization. Um, civilization for Strauss is the conscious culture or cultivation of our humanity, of what makes a human being a human being. And here he offers what has become increasingly contestable. But we have to take very seriously his claim that what makes a human being a human being is reason. So civilization is the conscious culture or cultivation of reason. And reason's two primary functions are the regulation of our conduct and the attempt to understand theoretically. So morals, the regulation of our conduct, and science, theoretical understanding. Science, in this sense, as the attempt to understand man in the universe, is equivalent, Strauss says, to philosophy. So modern science may be something else. Modern science may be the desire for the conquest of nature in the service of the relief of man's estate. But science, like the German Wissenschaft, in its broader meaning here, is the desire to understand man in the universe, the use of our reason for theoretical comprehension. Civilization for Strauss does not include art, which he says has nothing to do with the search for truth and the cultivation of virtue. And although he pays attention to the importance of art and poetry, he thinks that art is more closely aligned to the rejection of reason than it is to the acknowledgement of reason as the defining feature of human being. So civilization is the conscious culture of reason, not the culture or cultivation of blood and soil, not the culture or cultivation of ethnic identity, but the culture or the cultivation of reason. Civilization has a natural basis. So he says even civilized communities need an army just because you're civilized, it doesn't mean that you no longer have borders or need to defend them. Okay, so the cultivation of our reason still rests on the natural basis and therefore deals with friends and enemies, with scarcity, with the desire for conquest and all the rest of it, and therefore is embedded in political communities. Now, what's the relationship then between civilization and nihilism? I've already said for Strauss, nihilism is the rejection of the principles of civilization defined as the cultivation of our reason in the direction of morality and science. So, if nihilism is the rejection of the principles of civilization as such, and if civilization is based on recognition of the fact that the subject of civilization is man as man, the human being as such, every interpretation of science and morals in terms of races or nations or cultures is strictly speaking nihilistic. Think what he's saying. Racialism, nationalism in terms of like the analysis of science and morals in terms of their national identity or cultural identity is nihilistic because it rejects the universality and the humanity of reason. The few Greeks whom we usually have in mind when we speak of the Greeks, he writes, were distinguished from the barbarians, so to speak, exclusively by their willingness to learn even from barbarians. Whereas the barbarian, the non-Greek barbarian as well as the Greek barbarian, believes that all his questions are solved by or on the basis of his ancestral tradition. So here Strauss is distinguishing barbarism as the over- privileging of your own ancestral tradition to the exclusion of the possibility of learning from others with civilization as the openness to learn even from barbarians. And here he, he quotes Aristotle, we seek what is good, not what we have inherited. Now, of course, what we have inherited may be good. Our traditions may be good. He's not saying we have to deny our traditions. But he's saying we have to draw a distinction between the good as such, which we may find even amongst the barbarians, 
and our own. And if we identify the good with our own, we're not acting in a civilized manner, but rather in a barbaric manner. The temptation to fall back from an unimpressive present on an impressive past, and every past is as such impressive, is very great indeed, Strauss writes. We ought not to cede to that temptation, if for no other reason, at least for this, that the Western tradition is not so homogenous as it may appear as long as one is engaged in polemics or in apologetics. So if you think that the world today is horrible, has gone to the dogs, you may defend the glorious past of Western tradition, Western civilization, and that may have a place apologetically and polemically. But the Western tradition is variegated. It contains good and bad. It contains noble and base. So it's not enough to point to that tradition. We should seek not only the traditional, but we should seek the good. Instead of this temptation of falling back to a conservative defense of the past. Now, why did German nihilism take the form of militarism? We return to that question. Nihilism rejects the principles of civilization in favor of what? In favor of the military virtues. That's why nihilism is plausibly identified as purely destructive. Remember, not because we said, well, why isn't like alcohol? You could destroy yourself in the world, so to speak, through alcoholism. But in this sense, it's destructive because of its emphasis on military virtues. And as Strauss writes, war is a destructive business. Now, what's the argument again? What, what is the relationship between militarism and nihilism? Why the military virtues? Well, let's see. Militarism can be identified as the view that eternal peace is a dream and not even a beautiful one. Now, Strauss explains. To believe that eternal peace is a dream is not militarism but perhaps plain common sense. But to believe that eternal peace is not a beautiful dream is tantamount to believing that war is something desirable in itself. And to believe that war is something desirable in itself betrays a cruel and human disposition. The view that war is good in itself implies the rejection of the distinction between just and unjust wars, between wars of defense and wars of aggression. It's ultimately irreconcilable, he writes, with the very idea of a law of nations. By the way, this argument that war is good in itself and Strauss's rejection of the argument that war is good in itself recurs early on, a long time ago, in the first few books of Plato's Laws. Because when the Athenian stranger the main character of Plato's laws, talks to these old Greek men about the nature of their law and why, to what end, the lawgiver gave his laws. One of them answers that, the sake, that their laws are given for the sake of victory in war. And the Athenian stranger challenges the view that war is good in itself. So you can even see that argument assessed in Plato. But here Strauss is saying that the militaristic view that war is good in itself implies the rejection of the distinction between just and unjust wars. That's one of its shortcomings. Now the essay also argues that nihilism isn't identical to militarism. So militarism never asserted that science is essentially national. It never fully rejected like nihilism does morals and science. It recognizes to an extent the virtues of peace. But nihilism says that military virtues, courage especially, are the only virtues left. So nihilism elevates the military virtues as opposed to, for example, the theoretical virtues. German nihilism is therefore radicalized militarism for Strauss. So they're distinct, but they're akin. To understand one, we must understand the other. Now, to explain why militarism plays a role, why, why there's a militaristic strain in German history, Strauss argues as follows, that Germany is younger than the other Western nations, closer to barbarism, further from the ideals of modern civilization, which are English and French. And he says the English and French sought to lower the moral standards, like to the bourgeois level, 
but to make them more politically practicable than the classical standards of political life that you get in Plato and Aristotle, for example. Now, Germans rebelled against this lowering of the standards. German militarism is a reaction against French and English morality. It insists on self-sacrifice and self-denial as opposed to self-preservation. But he criticizes, Strauss criticizes the German reaction against French and English morality because they forgot the natural aim of man, which is happiness. They commit the error of the old Greeks in Plato's laws who think that the laws are given only for the sake of victory in war. They fail in their analysis of human excellence to put courage in the military virtues in their proper place. Now, the difference between self-interest, which you could say is like the British morality, and duty is sharpest in the case of courage and military virtue because courage is the only unambiguously unutilitarian virtue. You know, it's self, it's the peak of self-sacrifice as opposed to self-preservation. But again, for Strauss, German philosophers overstressed courage and military morality and in doing so created a peculiarly German tradition of contempt for common sense and the aims of human life. Now, when you pay attention to the culture wars today and you pay attention to the resurgence, if there is one, of reverence for military virtue, you must now understand with Strauss's assistance both the underlying motive and some of the shortcomings of that emphasis on military virtue. Now, Strauss ends his essay with a defense of now that he's given a sympathetic account of German nihilism, he ends his essay with a defense of the English. The English almost always had the very un-German prudence and moderation not to throw out the baby with the bath, baby with the bath water. They had the prudence to conceive of the modern ideals, you know, the lowered standards when compared to Plato and Aristotle, as a reasonable adaption of the old and eternal idea of decency, of rule of law, and of that liberty which is not license to changed circumstances. This taking things easy, this muddling through, this crossing the bridge when one comes to it, may have done some harm to the radicalism of English thought. In other words, here he may give German philosophy the upper hand. But it proved to be a blessing to English life. The English never indulged in those radical breaks with tradition which played such a role on the continent, for instance, in the French Revolution. Whatever may be wrong with the peculiarly modern idea, the very Englishmen who originated it, who originated the modern moral and political ideals, were at the same time versed in the classical tradition. While the English originated the modern ideal, the pre-modern ideal, the classical idea of humanity, was nowhere better preserved than in Oxford and Cambridge. So, Strauss believes that the British did a better job, did a better job than the Germans did, the German nihilists did, of carrying forward familiarity with and reverence for classical political rationalism under new circumstances in responding to the lowered moral ideals of the British and the French compared to the classical ideals, the Germans went too far throughout the baby with the bathwater. So what does Strauss write in conclusion in 1941? The present Anglo-German war is then of symbolic significance. In defending modern civilization, which I repeat means for Strauss the conscious cultivation of reason, in morals and science, in defending modern civilization against German nihilism, the English are defending the eternal principles of civilization. It is the English and not the Germans who deserve to be and to remain an imperial nation. For only the English and not the Germans have understood that in order to deserve to exercise imperial rule, one must have learned for a very long time to spare the vanquished and to crush the arrogant. 
Thus ends Strauss's lecture on German nihilism. So many rich reflections here on the nature of nihilism, on the nature of civilization, on the failure of teachers towards their young students, on the defense of the principles of modern civilization. So much here to think about. I hope that you found it helpful as I walk you through the main arguments of this essay. And thank you for watching. Lola and I will probably discuss some of this now. Um, so stay tuned.